Hello and welcome to English Lessons with Lakshmi. Today I am going to deal with the metaphysical poets, a group of poets including John Donne, Andrew Marvel, Henry Vaughan, uh, George Herbert, Richard Crashaw, who lived in the 17th century England. The term metaphysical was not used in a positive sense at the beginning. It was John Dryden who said about them that these poets affected the metaphysics. And Dr. Samuel Johnson, in his Life of Cowley, made a detailed appraisal of their work. And he said that they were men of learning, that is these poets, they were men of learning and to show their learning was their sole endeavor. So he called them wit, wits or men of intelligence. He credits them with originality because they came up with new ideas, but he felt that they were not at all natural, they were pretentious, that is what he felt. So this was uh, how the world looked at the metaphysical poets in those days, in the contemporary times. And uh, it was later, much later, when H. J. C. Grierson brought out his collection of books, an anthology titled Metaphysical Lyrics and Poems of the, 19th, of the 17th Century. It was in that book that he attempted to make a compilation of all these 17th century metaphysical poets. And the metaphysical poets owe a lot to H. J. C. Grierson for what he did because it was through this book that these poets came to the notice of the modern writers like T. S. Eliot, the modern critics like T. S. Eliot. T. S. Eliot was totally bowled over by the metaphysical poetry and he found that they are in all, they were excellent in their work and in his essay which came out in 1921, it actually was a, a review of H. J. C. Grierson's book, the essay titled The Metaphysical Poets in 1921. There he uh, devoted his attention to a detailed analysis of metaphysical poetry and he uh, felt that they were of a very high uh, class and uh, in poetry and uh, uh, he placed John Donne on the top of the hierarchy of poets and Milton and Dryden and all the others he felt come only after John Donne. And uh, he credited the metaphysical poets with uh, possessing this quality of unified sensibility. You must have come across the term of dissociation of sensibility and it is a term that was used by T. S. Eliot uh, and he said that when you look at the poets from the Elizabethan or the Jacobian age, they all possessed a unified sensibility including Dunn up to Milton they had this unified sensibility and let me just read what the exact words of um, T. S. Eliot. He says, they possessed a mechanism of sensibility which could devour any kind of experience. They manifested a direct sensuous apprehension of thought and felt their thought as immediately as the odor of a rose. So this uh, ability to unify thought and feeling is what he called unified sensibility. And after uh, a, a while, after the Elizabethan poets and the Jacobians and the metaphysical poets, by the time it came to Milton and later on to the, the poem, poets of um, the age of reason and again to the romantics, he said this was lost and instead a dissociation of sensibility set in. Uh, he says that uh, in the age of reason, the poet, the poets had expressed a lot of thought, but there was no feeling. And what happened during the Romantic age was that there was so much an overabundance of feeling, but hardly any thought. And then he says that it was the moderns, like including himself, who once again regained this unified sensibility. So uh, by his analysis of metaphysical poetry, he did something wonderful to the metaphysical poets. He brought them back into the limelight and people began to once again read metaphysical poetry with renewed interest. And when we read metaphysical poetry, we find that it is very much in keeping with the tastes of modernity. 
maybe it was jarring to the ears of the of the Elizabethans then, uh, and uh, and it would, it would have been. It is. I have heard. I've read that um, women fainted reading John Donne's poems because it was so stark and so harsh, and the images were so violent. And as uh, the critics, as Johnson himself has said, that the most heterogeneous ideas are yoked by violence together. So we can imagine uh, the shock that people like Dunn would have caused at a time when lovers were compared to roses and flowers and doves. Here was a man who said that two lovers can be compared to two legs of a compass. How dry and how frightening it must have see sounded to the people who were used to the mellifluous romantic verses of those days. And so, but today, uh, to our sensibility, John Donne and Andrew Marvel and all of them seem perfectly suited. So it is no wonder that metaphysical poets are quite popular today. Now let me just go through the, uh, the characteristic, the underlying features of metaphysical poetry. One, metaphysical poetry broke away from the conventional tradition. The melody is mellifluous um, kind of versification. They discarded that and they started out on a new path. The second point to be noted was that metaphysical poetry was more analytical and philosophical. Rather than being purely romantic or sentimental like the poetry of those days, the metaphysical po poets chose to be more realistic. They were oftentimes ironic and even bitingly sarcastic and cynical at times. So in that too, they were different from the contemporary schools of poetry. And the third point I would like to mention is how they changed the poetic diction. Instead of the uh, poetic language, the so-called poetic language, they used contemporary and often colloquial language. Often uh, their poems would seem like an argument between two people, a dialogue with somebody, uh, a heated argument sometimes. So that was a change that they brought about. The metaphysical poets did not follow a regular pattern of versification. Instead, they wrote in a manner that suited their theme and style. Another point is that the metaphysical poets uh, were very varied in their selection of theme. They wrote about religion, they wrote about spirituality, they wrote about love and uh, they were oftentimes philosophical. So in the theme too, they varied from the others. A marked feature of metaphysical poetry was the use of conceits or far-fetched similes or strained metaphors as you would call them. Uh, in order to elaborate their ideas, they borrowed freely and they took comparisons from science, from geology, metallurgy, mythology, etc. They were all scholars and the scholarliness was reflected in their verse too. Now let me give you uh, a couple of examples of the popular, most popular conceits from metaphysical poetry. One is the example that I mentioned earlier about two po uh, lovers being compared to two metal legs of a, a compass, which is a very unromantic kind of a comparison, but yet it serves its purpose very well. The, the, the woman or the female, the lover, she is the center, the point, which is always steadfast. And the man is the other leg that keeps rotating around. And wherever he goes, the, the, the fixed leg leans and ha so that he will always be inspired to come back. So the woman is the one who brings back her lover to her with her love. So that is one example. And then there is also this example of uh, in John Dunn of uh, how um, even if they are in his uh, poem called Valediction Forbidding Morning, he talks about, uh, he talks to his lover and consoles her and tells her that even if they are far away, their love is not going to endure a breach. It is not going to be broken or damaged in any way. Instead, now here he borrows a comparison from metallurgy. He says that instead uh, their love would expand like gold which can be beaten into thin airy sheets. 
The more it is beaten, the more it would expand, but never break. So this again uh, is an example of a conceit. So the, the conceit is a defining feature of metaphysical poetry. And metaphysical poetry again uh, employs the shock tactic, especially Dunn is a master of this particular uh, technique. He uses the shock tactic. He opens the poem without much ado, straight away he goes on. He is often in a highly impassioned mood, he is angry at an interruption or some such thing. And uh, in the poem Sun Rising, there is, there, these two lovers are together and the sun is intruding into them, into the room and disturbing them. And he says, busy old fool, unruly sun. Now that is the way he opens the poem. And so this is an example of a shock tactic. And again, in canonization, he begins by saying, for God's sake, hold your tongue and let me love. And so this again was shocking, not only as a tactic, but to the sensibility of the fine, refined sensibility of those days, it must definitely have been shocking. And so these are the some of the common features of metaphysical poetry. And all the metaphysical poets, though they don't display all these at once, in some way or the other you can find that all the metaphysical poets share these common features.